let's pick this up in, in um, I have, uh, so how, G, when, in, in Mark, so we start at Mark eleven twenty two, 22, which is have just simply this, have faith in God. And that I talked about extensively, that when you have faith in somebody, it depends on the object of your faith. How faithful is that object? How faithful is it? So you can deal with people. Talked about, you know, how, how there are people you can trust. There's people you don't trust. Why? Because they don't hold up their word. But God has always held up his word. So we can trust him in ever, whatever he says. And um, then I went to, last week, uh, I went to 2 Corinthians 4.13. 2 Corinthians 4.13. This is the heart or the spirit of faith. And since we have the same spirit of faith, now that's not the Holy Spirit. It's the, the uh, as I described, the spirit is something like a, uh, the, the essence of faith, how it works. And it's according to what is written. And he quotes an Old Testament scripture. He says, I believed and therefore I spoke. And Paul says, we also believe and therefore speak. And we use this all the time in the Bible. This is uh, uh, shown, especially I went to Romans 10, 9 and 10, that says that if you confess Jesus Lord, believe it in your heart and say it with your, and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So there's the principle again that whatever you when you say something and you you believe something you say what you believe. And this we this works in all areas of our lives. Okay? And so Jesus when he says in Mark 11:22, he says have faith in God. Have faith in the character and the integrity of who God is. And that, so the object of your faith that's where you, you have your faith is in that object. And the only way your faith grows in or lessens in any object that you're putting your faith into is how much knowledge do you have in it. The more knowledge you have in God, the greater your faith. It's as simple as that. Less knowledge, less faith. Jesus reprimanded his disciples. Oh, you of little faith. Why? Even after they saw him do things, they still doubted. And he called them out on it. Okay? And we, we deal with the same thing. So, if I believe something, then I will say it. And my confession is, the, is actually is the action of my belief, which is the third point. Faith is an action word. Faith is an action word. You have to put feet to your faith. Another uh, author I just read, in fact, I'm going to be quoting from Tozer, and Tozer and other preachers and teachers have said, faith is like a muscle. You have to use it. You have to use it. If you don't use it, it will atrophy, just like any muscle. That's why if you sit in bed for three months and you get up, you're going to have a problem walking. Okay, because you haven't used those muscles. You haven't been doing it. So you need to use the, what you believe. So when you have something, you say, well, like, Pastor, like, how does that work? Well, what is it you're believing for? What, is, what, what area in your life are you believing that you need to increase your faith? Then you need to go to the Bible and find where that is. Find specific scriptures that promise you those things and then believe God for them. So um, let's go. Oh, oh, you got all three of them there? Well, thank you, Lindsay. Let's do the first one. So these are the three aspects of faith that I've been teaching on. Number one, faith depends on its object. It's the object of our belief that either rewards or destroys our faith. Now, we just had something happen last night, and uh, a car wreck. Everybody's fine. But you know what? Somebody's just driving down the road, and you think it's safe to drive down the street anytime. And guess what? Somebody blew a stop sign and went right and T-boned them. 
So now the next time that person is driving there, he's wondering, is somebody going to believe, is, is somebody going to trust? Do I trust that stop sign or not? How many have been gone through a red or going through a green light and somebody hit you or nearly hit you? And you trusted that stop sign. You, you trusted that green light and it failed you. Not of it, you know, it's just because people aren't paying attention. Okay, so then the second one, the depth of the, the depth or the amount of faith is determined by the depth of your knowledge of the object. In other words, you and me determine, not God, not God. You and I determine the depth of our faith. I, I bring this guy up often, George Mueller. You want to read an awesome testimony of a man of God, read the autobiography of George Mueller or a biography of George Mueller. And the things that he believed God for every single day, he told these orphans that he was a huge orphanage in London, England. And, and he promised them that you will have milk every single day. And they did. And there were times they were all seated at the table and they're all waiting and they're going, like, I can't remember if they called him Father Mueller or whatever, but they're wondering where he says, just wait, God's going to show up. And you know what? He did every single time. That's because George Mueller had this great faith. In a, you know, somebody once said, he didn't have great faith. It, uh, he had faith in a great God. That's what it was. And that goes back to have faith in God. Have faith in the person of God. What, how integrous, how much character does God have? What are the attributes of God that I can put my faith into? And I tell you, the first one we ought to all is that he is good. You got to know he's good. You have to know he's good. And you got to know he's faithful. You got to know that. And if you aren't sure, then you got to go to your Bible and see where he was. And I, you, you don't even, you can get right to the book of Judges. I believe, no. Is it Judges or Numbers? I'm trying to think, but it says that, oh, no, it's Joshua, that it said that God did not fail in every single promise. He did not fail. That's Old Testament. Yeah. So I believe, therefore I spoke. Now, uh, we're going to go to Mark 5, 25. Now, this is a really familiar, I use it. I mean, a lot of preachers use this because why? Because it's good. It demonstrates exactly what we're talking about. Because if, if, if you can't back up anything, and I, I tell this all the time, whatever I say, you better judge it. You better judge it. Hello? Yeah. You know, I've had people come up to me. Um, uh, it's funny because I'm thinking of Chris, I'm thinking of Mark. Mark has, has since gone on to be with the Lord, but one time I said, the body, it says, Jesus said, do not say the harvest, the, uh, the harvest is away. And he came up to me and said, Pastor, it doesn't say do not say. It says, do you, no, do you not say that the harvest is? I go, oh, my, doggone, it does. Okay. So uh, you should judge everything that any preacher or teacher says. You, you, you judge it by the word. And, and if there's something that I say and you say, Pastor, I, I don't know about that, then then. Ask me, okay? So, Mark 25, Mark 5, 25 and 34, we're going to go through this, okay? Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians, and she had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, now, I went back in, in before, but they had already People were already touching Jesus before this to get healed, even if they didn't, if he didn't even lay hands on them. The Bible says before this lady that people were just touching him. So she already had heard, you know, you don't even have, he don't even have to lay hands on him. If you just grab him, you'll get healed. And so she got, she heard about that and she came behind him in the crowd and she did what she heard others do. Well, if it worked for them, it'll work for me. And so she touched him, and she said, if I, she believed it, and she spoke it. 
the spirit of faith, I believe, therefore I speak. So she believed that if I only touch his clothes, I shall, I shall be made well. She was saying that. And immediately the, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around. Like, who was that? Somebody grabbed me with faith. And she said, and he said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples, well, how, look at there's, there's all kinds of people around. How do we know who did it? And, and, and they said, you see the throng? You see the multitude thronging you? And you say, who touched me? How are we supposed to know? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. And the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And that's how we have the story, because the disciples were there, and one of them was named Matthew, who told his story to Mark. Mark got his gospel mostly from, from Matthew. And he told this son. So we have an eyewitness. And the story's in Matthew also. And, and, and she, the eyewitness, this is what happened. And she told Jesus, all these people are listening to this. So she did exactly what we talk about. She believed it, and then she spoke it. And, and where, was, what, where was her faith? Well, her faith was in Jesus. Her faith was in Jesus. Have faith in God. Who was the object of her faith? Jesus. She had a knowledge that he had the power to heal her because she'd heard about others grabbing a hold of him. So she said, she, it didn't take a whole lot of faith for Listen, when we think, when we measure faith, well, it has to be, you know, it's just huge, it's huge. But Jesus said, the hugeness of it only needs to be a size of a mustard seed. If you had the, the faith of a mustard seed, okay? So then she had knowledge that he had the power to hear, heal her, and then what did she do? She just didn't, you know, if I, if, I just go, if I just go there, if I just go there, if I just grab a hold of his garment, and she could have said that for 15 and 20 years, and nothing would have happened until she went. That's when she acted on what she believed. That was her faith. She went and she went and she, to him and did exactly what she had heard others do. So how do you get rid of doubt? What See, Jesus said in, Matthew, in Mark eleven twenty four uh, three 23, that if you say to this mountain and be removed and do not doubt where? In your heart. See, you can have it here, but you don't want to hear because here is where you really believe. This is where you really believe. You really believe somebody like when... I told my wife, I love you. And she says, I love you too. I believed it. Yeah. Where did I believe that? Right here. Yeah. You know? Um, that's where you believe it. It's, it's in your core. It's right. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if you, well, no, Pastor, you're about to feel right, right here. No. I mean, it's, I, it, we all know what we're talking about. It's hard to describe, but you know where the heart of where you believe is. And, 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 and it's, it's a tangible, intangible thing. And so he said, don't get it in there. It's, don't get it from here to leak down here. You want to keep it out of here, out of your heart. And so how do you do that? By having faith in God and saying what you believe that he can do. This is not complicated. It's really not. The hard part is when we, we say, we believe it, and we, we, we confess what, he's, what his word says, and we don't see anything happening. That's okay. See, that's what pleases God, that you'll believe him when, you, when it doesn't look like anything's going on. That's what pleases him, that you just keep saying, he's faithful, he's faithful. I use this illustration, I use it often, because the first one I think of is just when you see people that um, you're believing for their salvation and nothing's going on. In fact, it looks worse than it was when you first started praying for them. They go deeper into, 
into whatever it is. That was my case. I told about my older brother and sister-in-law. They were praying for me. It, and, you know, it didn't look like Pastor Steve, this, this, you know, little brother Steve's, he's not getting any better. He's getting worse. But, you know, they never stopped believing. Right. Never stopped believing. I, I, I can think in my own life, people that I believe for. Oh, my goodness. Um, I think of, uh, well, Rick and Kathy Limbo used to be elders here until they moved to Central Oregon. Their oldest son came to me once. He was a teenager. He said, I don't know uh, where I'm with Jesus. I, I don't, I, I'm really doubting all of this, you know, because he was riding on his parents' coattails, and now all of a sudden the enemy's coming after him. And what does he do? He says, I, I don't know. And I said, you know what? I want you to do something. I said, I want you to go home. I want you to read this story, and I want you to find in that story what is the most important line or verse in that story. And I gave him the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. I said, you read that, and you come back to me and tell me what is the most significant line in that story. And he came back, and he goes, I think I know what it is. I go, what is it? He says, how long will you be torn between two opinions? And he walked away from God. And I prayed for him. He moved out. He moved away. He moved all the way to Michigan. And he ended up living with some gal. And he ended up, you know, just away from God. And we never stopped praying. I never stopped praying for him without just the Reader's Digest version because it gets pretty long. He came back to the Lord and he's serving God full time. Full on for God. Yeah. Left that lady, left her the house. Didn't even take the house that was his. Left everything behind Woo. and came out here. <laughs> yeah. And came out here and, he's, and, and he has since found a godly woman and it's his wife and they're doing awesome. Now, I could have looked with the eyes of faith and I'd hear reports, Rick and Kathy, you know, it's, uh, he's still, you know, he's doing this, he's in this, he's in that, he's... Uh, Nope, nope, I'm believing God. He's got a heritage. His parents believed it, and it's coming. It's just a matter of time. Amen? So, number two, how do I keep doubt out? So, the, the, the first one is, is knowing God, okay? Just, just knowing who he is. Okay, number two, how to keep doubt out. Watch what God has done in his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, okay? Now, if you, Lindsay, I didn't, I didn't give you this one, but uh, Acts, Acts 2.33. So faith comes by hearing, but faith not only comes by hearing, but it also comes by seeing. Faith will come by seeing. Let me give you an example. In Acts 2, Peter came up there. Everybody, you know, this is when the Holy Ghost is poured out, day of Pentecost. They're all speaking in tongues. The people are looking at it, and they're going, this is the craziest thing we've ever seen. These people are speaking in languages of all these, and all these different Jews had gathered there in Jerusalem, and they're seeing all this going on. They go, these people are drunk. And they're going, no, it can't be. It's not that hour of the day for people to be hammered. So it, 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 it's not that. It, it isn't that. And then Peter j jumps up, and, you know, he's full of the Holy Ghost. He's been filled with the Holy Ghost, and he stands up, and he says, this is that that the prophet Joel said would happen in the last days. This is that. And then he goes off on this preaching, and he tells them everything they did and how they crucified this Lord, and they crucified the God of Israel. And they're like, Ugh. you know, and so he keeps preaching, and he says, Therefore, being to the right hand of God and having received the promise of the Father, and he says, did I get that right? Yeah, no. Is, did I get that wrong? What? Here it is. The Holy Spirit. It was verse 34, sorry. Or 33. Oh, she had it wrong. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Lynn. No, don't, don't give me a hard time. Okay. Of the Holy Spirit. He poured out, he poured this out, this which you see and hear. 
So when they saw this, and then they heard it, and then he preaches the gospel to them, and then they, he, and he says, you murdered him. Thou shalt not murder. The law is a tutor to Christ. And when they saw, oh my gosh, we did. We were there. Thousands of them were watching this. And he says, you murdered him. And you saw this, which was then poured out by the Holy Ghost. And they were convicted. He said, what must we do to be saved? And he says, repent and be baptized. But they saw and they heard and faith came because of what they saw and they heard. Now let's look at Mark 9, 14. And this is a story of a, um, a man. And I believe it's his son. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples and that they should cast it out, but they couldn't. He answered him and he says, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you or bear with you? Oh, I'm going, and so this, this is what this, this uh, it's the inability of the disciples to cast this devil out of this man. And Jesus says, so they brought him to him, and immediately he saw him, he convulsed his spirit, and he fell on the ground foaming and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. And so he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, if, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. What did we sing here? I believe, I believe. You know what we were doing? We were confessing what we believe. What were we confessing? That he is the God of miracles. See, it's amazing how a lot, some, some in the church have, uh, uh, Jesus is the, not the God who is, but the God who was. He's not the God who is, he's the God who was. He did do that, but he's not doing it anymore. We did have the gifts of the Spirit, but we don't have them anymore. Again, if I told you that, you should come to me and tell me, Pastor, the gifts are gone. Now, if you do think they are gone, and that's fine if you believe that. I'm not telling you you're a horrible person. But show me where it says they're gone. Give me, show me, and I'm not, I won't argue with you. I'll just show you what I think the Bible says, okay? Show me. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, Lord, with tears, said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people coming, running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit and said to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Now, he didn't say in Jesus' name because he didn't need to, <laughs> Okay? Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he's dead. He was that lifeless. And Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Amen. Isn't that awesome? You can stop right there, Linz. Check this out. Oh, Linz, can you go back to where it says, uh, if you can only believe? I'm not sure which verse that is. Thank you. Now, understand, in the Greek, there are no commas, apostrophes, right? It's, it, you, 
How many of you ever seen Greek in, in, your, in an interlinear Bible, okay? It's just word, word, word. There's no commas, okay? So they kind of, when they're translating, they're going, well, how does this thought go, this, this word, and so where we can put a comma in? So the translators on this, now there are some manuscripts that are different in this, in the punctuation. So think of it this way. If you can, comma. Some manuscripts have that. If you can, comma, believe. All things are possible to him who believes. If you can, believe. How can we believe? Go to here. Go to here. Faith comes by hearing. That's how you can. You say, well, I just, I just don't know, Pastor, that, that this, this. How's it going to grow? By the knowledge. It's going to grow. Your faith is going to grow by the knowledge that you have in him. You say, well, it's, I just, I, I'm just not there. You can get there. I've gotten there. Hello? You know what's the beauty of, of, of being born again and coming into the kingdom of God is everybody starts at the same place. Everybody starts at the same place. Everybody, like little Audrey. Little Audrey's on milk. And she will be. Until she gets older, she gets some chompers, and then we can give her some meat. And you and I were the same way. Spiritually, we were babes. And then we get to a place where we are eating meat. So if you, he's saying, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, help my doubt, help me get the doubt out. And he said, you can if you will believe in him. If you will believe in the one who sent me. If you'll believe me that I can do it, it will happen. And he says, uh, and, and he, so he says, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. See, so he actually says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And so he goes, okay, I'll show you. I'll show you how that, I'll help you with your unbelief. Come out of him. That's how I'll show you. I'll demonstrate right now. Come out of him. Now, I didn't know if I was going to give this story, but I, this actually happened to me. <laughs> this actually happened to me. And, and listen, what's funny is I tell this story. I've told this story to guys that I used to work with, and they knew me. They knew me well. They knew that I wouldn't lie, that I wouldn't lie about this. And so I'm going to tell you this. This is an amazing story. And I had only dealt with demon possession one other time before, so I had some experience. And that first time, I really didn't have much. I, I, it, was, it freaked me out pretty good. In fact, the pastor, I ran, ran into the pastor's office. I said, this girl, this young lady is you know, crawling on the floor like a snake. And he goes, well, go cast the devil out of her. And he went back to his work. And I'm like, eh, you know. And, and so I, I went, we went back to the room, and, and nothing was happening. It, wouldn't, it didn't have any success. So I went back to him, and he said, all right. So he comes back there. So, I mean, this was really crazy. So I get a phone call. And they always gave me, at the office, they always directed all the phone calls about Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, or cults to Pastor Steve. <laughs> because I had studied them and I knew about them. And so there's, it said, I've got a lady on the phone. She's, uh, the Mormons are coming to the house. She's got five, four or five kids. And uh, she wants to know what the real gospel is. Perfect. So we go to the house, and she had a son. His name was Seth, and Seth had some, had, had some medical problems. But in the midst of having these medical problems, he was having visions. And he said, Jesus is showing up. He'd tell her. He'd tell his mom. And then he'd tell her what Jesus said. And you know what? I was thinking, okay, all right. He was quoting scripture word for word to his mom that Jesus said in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so I go there. Turns out she tells us she's been involved in witchcraft since she was young. She's got burn marks all over her arms from cigarettes and cuttings and stuff 
that her folks were involved in a, co a coven. Is that what you call a coven? And I was like, dang, this is crazy. So we would go over there and talk to her and minister to the kids and everything. Annie and I would go over there. Well, I get a call on guess what night? <laughs> Halloween. Yeah. Halloween. And she says, you got to come over here. I'm, I'm all freaked out. I'm Diana. So we're driving there. And while we're driving there, I am praying in the Holy Spirit. And you know, the Bible says that when you pray in the Holy Spirit and you're praying in tongues, that pray that you may interpret. And so I was just, I'm just praying in the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, I start getting this word. And I'm going, what in the world? And I keep praying. And I get the word potentate. Potentate. And I go, wait a minute. That's in the Bible. I go, that's in the Bible. And it's in, I believe it's 2 Timothy, at the very end of 2 Timothy. And it says that Jesus is the only potentate. And it's like 2 Timothy, maybe it's 1 Timothy. But in any case, I was like, I know that word. And, and so well, here it is. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus. And so I realized I've gone in there with the authority of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So we go in there, and she's laying on her bed, and I said, what's going on? We're talking. And, and she's I just, I'm not, you know, she's all freaked out. And so well, I'm going to pray for you. So I laid hands on her. And everything that you see in that story happened on that bed. That was crazy. She started, the, started bouncing on the bed. She started foaming in her mouth. She started convulsing. Folks, I'm, I'm not lying to you, okay? I mean, I saw this. If I'm lying, I, I, there's a place for those people, okay? So, and I don't want to go there, and I'm not going there. And then she just went limp, and I thought she died. I'm serious. I thought she died. I, I, she just was limp, and I cast a devil out of her, and I told her, you know, I told her, leave in the name of Jesus. And she just went dead, and I'm like, you were, no, you, were you in the room? Or the kids, oh, we put the kids out with want to see that you don't want to see your mom like this and so uh, I thought what the, I could, did, she, did she die and so we checked her pulse no she's alive <sighs> thank you Jesus <laughs> and then she just was asleep she just went out and so we just hung out with the kids for the for the night for for a good for a little bit and then you know we left them and because they had an older one that, that was could could babysit and we just left and yeah, and, and I lost contact with her, but I did stay in contact with her till then. But I tell you what, when you talk about faith growing by seeing, not just hearing, I tell you what, when I walked out of that apartment that day, that night, my faith, boom, because I saw what God can do through a, a willing vessel. So it's not just faith does come by hearing, but it'll come by seeing also. And the Bible shows that right there. So I grew. So how did I grow? Number one, I had faith in God. Number two, I had a depth of a knowledge of God that I have an authority that he has given me and you. You have that same authority. I'm not special. Don't, after you hear this story, don't go, oh, Pastor Steve's this mighty man of God. No. You have the same, you have the same, well, we've all been given a measure of faith. It's what we do with the measure. But you all have the same authority. Do not be afraid of the devil. Okay? Jesus is far, far, far above all principalities, powers, and forces of evil, and wickedness, and all that garbage. 
It's why we worship him. That's why we sing songs about it's a beautiful name. It's the most powerful name. Why? Because it is. It is. I mean, I've heard demons say, don't say that name. Or what was it? Was it say, don't say that name and, and, and don't pray in the spirit. Oh, they know all this. Oh, the blood. That's what it was. That's right. That's right. We pled the blood of Jesus over this young lady. And the voice came out of her and said, not the blood. What's that tell you? Use it. There's power, power, wonder-working power. There's power, power. You know, people were probably the same old saints that sing that song and probably didn't know what it meant, really. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of Jesus. Yes. So the first thing I did is I had faith in God. He was the object of my faith. I had a knowledge of his word that if I use his name in faith, this devil has to go. It has to go. And then the other thing is I acted on that. See, I could have gone there and she's there and she's all, you know, I go, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And the Bible says, cast the devil out. It says, in my name, these signs shall follow you who believe. In my name, you shall cast out devils. So it says in Mark, right? Mark 12, Mark 14. It says, these signs will follow you. 14, 16, 14, I think. Yeah, yeah. So it, she's got it right. She's got the right address. So these signs will follow you who believe. Believe what? In God, in my faith in God. These signs shall follow. One of them is you shall cast out devils. That's what you shall do. Now, you're not, you don't have to go around looking for it. Don't go around looking for them. God, I've had people do that. The guy that led me to the Lord, he had a good friend, and this guy was always looking for devils. I mean, the, the devil's in the trees, the devil's in the bush, the devil's in the ground. I, I, that's everywhere. I'm like, and I'm like, I don't care about that. All I care about is Jesus. That's all I care about. That's all I want to know about. I don't want to know. I don't need to know anything about the devil other than that he's defeated. That's all you need to know. He's defeated, and he's a deceiver, and he's a liar. I, I mean, there's other things you can know about him that, that'll help, but you don't need to worry about, and, and, and if you sense that there is something attacking you, then you use the name of Jesus and use the blood of Jesus. They don't like it. They don't like it. And when you do that, guess what? Doubt went out. Doubt went out. The main lesson of this miracle is the power of faith. Faith in Jesus. Faith in what he could do. I'm talking about this, not me, but this story that we just read about this young boy. He had faith in Jesus, faith in what he could do, faith in what he did, and faith in what he said he would do. So why had the disciples failed? Because they had, they'd been careless in their personal spiritual walk. They let their guard down, and it happens. They, he said, this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. They hadn't been praying. They hadn't been fasting. Remember Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount, when you pray, do this. Don't, don't pray so everybody sees you're praying. Okay? And he says, and when you fast. So he assumed that after he left, or while he was still there, that they would fast. How many love fasting? How many fast? Don't raise your hand. It's not an easy, you know, but you don't, it's not just food. It can be. I mean, mostly that's what we're thinking of. But you can fast anything, and you'll find out whether that thing has a grip on you when you give it up. I got delivered of everything in my life before, before when I got saved except for chocolate. The authority that Jesus had given them was effective only if exercised by faith. But that faith has to be cultivated through the spiritual discipline 
and devotion. I'll say that again. The authority that Jesus had given them was effective only if they exercised it by faith. And that faith has to be cultivated through spiritual discipline and devotion. And that's true. And that can hurt. Amen? I was reading here, um, Lindsay and Michael gave me a a 365-day devotional that's just, that's all the bigger the devotion. Isn't that, that's the kind of devotional I like. Uh, by A.W. Tozer. And when we're talking about having faith in God, the knowledge of God, that's where it decreases or increases how much we gain. And I just, this was for January 13th. I was like, wow, the timing of the Lord. And he says here, he quotes this, this scripture, for when the, the time we ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which by the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. And then this is what Tozer said on that. Probably the most widespread and persistent problem to be found among Christians. Now, you got to understand, this was written before 1964. He died in 64. Probably the most widespread and persistent problem to be found among Christians is the problem of retarded spiritual progress. Why, after years of Christian profession, do so many persons find themselves no further along than when they first believed? The causes of retarded growth are many. It would not be accurate to ascribe the trouble to one single fault. One there is, however, which is so universal that it may easily be the main cause. Failure to give time to the cultivation of the knowledge of God. Progress in the Christian life is exactly equal to the growing knowledge we gain of the triune God in personal experience. This is exactly one of the aspects I said. I go, oh my, this is spot on. I'll say that again. Progress in the Christian life is exactly equal to the growing knowledge we gain of the triune God in personal experience. And such experience requires a whole life devoted to it and plenty of time spent at the holy task of cultivating God. God can be known satisfactorily satisfactorily, only as we devote time to him. Amen? So, I know that I would not have been effective with the Lord, for the Lord, with this, with Shirley, that gal, if I didn't know who God was, what he could do, what his word said, and if I didn't have a prayer life. And you know what? I can challenge myself. My prayer life needs to be better. I'll be honest with you. My, my prayer life can be better. Well, Pastor Steve, on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you think it is? None of your, none of your business. But I'm just like everybody else. You know, your life has ebbs and flows with your discipline and, and your devotion and, and you're on and you're off. Because it, it, it takes work to stay on. Amen? I mean, you, you, know, you, you have to stir yourself up. You have to. Nobody's going to do it for you. But God is always, you know, there, that's a great, I, I know I quote Tozer off, but, but that's a, a great book that you can, I think every believer ought to read The Pursuit of God. I think every single believer ought to read that book. And, and he, he, it's just how God is after us. He's pursuing us. We don't, we don't, we don't realize how much he loves us and wants this relationship with us. He wants to talk to us. He wants to, he wants to you know, show himself to us. He wants to show who he is and all his goodness and his beauty. And, 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 and he wants to mold us and shape us into the image of his son, it says in Romans. That's what he wants to do. And, and so that we can be these lights. It, it says in, in Philippians, one translation, I think it's the NIV, it says that we are like lights in the universe. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be lights in this world that we're in. So we're effective and not ineffective. And so we, that, that's why we want this, 
build this relationship with him, have this faith in him so that when the mountain is there, we won't doubt in our heart because we know what his word says. We know what his word says. So in conclusion, how do I keep doubt out? Confess the word. Why believe? Therefore I spoke. And then number two, remember God's delivering healing power in his word. Not just healing and deliverance, but anything that's in his word. Remember it. Bring it to remembrance. So the, the man with the demoniac son, he saw Jesus' power at work, and his unbelief turned to belief because he saw what Jesus did. And when you go to the word and you see what God does, your faith will increase. Amen? And lastly, Ephesians 3.20, probably pray this more than anything that I pray when I pray over people, and that is now to him who can do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we think or even ask according to the power that works within us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead that lives in your mortal body. It's there. There's power there. Tap into it. Amen? All right. We've got, uh, I think I've got a, maybe one or, yeah, I haven't gotten to, uh, that's verse 23. I, uh, 23 also says, and therefore in all things when you pray. I believe it's, that's when you pray, therefore, believe you have received. That is key. 